Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grace Church. If you came in late and you didn't hear that welcome, we're so glad that you are here today. Whether this is your first time, whether you're watching online, or you've been part of Grace Church for a long while, we're just glad that you're here. As we're busy with the second part of our series, What is Faith? Now, if you guys kind of like followed our story when, when we started the process of um, the interviews and everything with Grace Church, you would know that Last year in July, our youngest daughter, Annabelle, was born, and a week after she was born, we got COVID. Okay, it was before we really had vaccines in South Africa. It wasn't Omicron. It was still Delta. We still all thought we were going to die back then. And um, I was stressed about this as, as well, and they did all kinds of tests to see if I would be fine with my asthma, and I was fine, except for two things that was really bad. One is I lost my taste, and two is I lost my smell. Now, let me tell you, if you've got a one and a half week old daughter that you cannot see because you have to isolate separately, one of the few joys you have left in life is to eat, <laughs> especially if you love food. And then when you lose your taste and your smell, that's really bad because now that joy has been sucked out of you as well. I'm like, I still ate chocolate just for the sake of it. I was like, I know there's, it has been proven, right, that it is good for us psychologically, so I'm just eating chocolate. But um, I don't know if you guys saw some of these COVID taste tests on social media, where people will have a box like this, numbered, and afterwards I realized I should have started one this side for, for your sake, like, but this is the Hebrew way of writing, right, from right to left. So um, you've got a box like this with different liquids that someone has to taste, and then there's all kinds of interesting things, and this is normally the response of a lot of people who lost their taste and they smell, they're like, it's water. Or as Canadians say, water. I've learned from Abigail, switch a T to a D, and then it's more Canadian, right? So, water. And um, we, we're going to do that test today. So, I need a volunteer, but I'm afraid someone that's too old might die from my experiment. So, I need someone under the age of 25. Under 25, come on, raise your hand, or I'm picking you. Last chance. Where's that? Okay, come on. That took like literally five minutes. <laughs> if you ask me, I would have been up here because there's some good stuff waiting for you on this table. So we're going to do a little bit of an experiment today and see if our volunteer still has his taste. I know there was some COVID in your family as well. Did you have COVID? Yeah. Did you lose your taste? No. Okay, let's see. So you're going to stand this side. And we're going to start from number one. I need the microphone. And um, you're going to taste one. So my straw is other way, other way, other side. You're going to face me. That's it. So you're going to taste one and then tell me what it is. My straws were a little short, so I had to extend them. I hope they work. Okay, so we're going to start with number one. Try it and tell me what it is. This is your first straw. Tastes like water. Okay. <laughs> He says it tastes like water. Maybe he did lose his smell. We don't know. We're going for straw two. Tastes like either water or Perrier without the, without the, the carbon. <laughs> That's still pretty much water. Maybe he did lose his, his taste. Okay, number three. Straw three. I tasted this morning. <laughs> okay. This is different. It tastes like weird, like bubble gum, like flavor. Okay, so there's some flavor in it. Okay, go for number four. All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Must I give you one of the other ones? Grab some water from number one. Oh. <laughs> Wait, straw got wind. I drank the most out of that. I take a big gulp. <laughs> And it was vinegar. Now, what if, what if I told you that all four are exactly the same thing? Uh, they look the same. They look the same. Did they taste the same? No. So let's, let's see if he was correct. Number one was water. Number two was? 
water. Number three was water with tropical fruit liquid sweetener. Number four was with white vinegar. It's like a 50-50 mix. It's the only one I didn't try. I was too afraid. So I don't know if you want to have more of number three, just to, to um, cleanse those taste buds. Thank you for your help. So this is the interesting thing. Make sure you've got number two and not four. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Wen. This is the interesting thing. Just because two things look the same doesn't mean they are the same. A couple of years ago, we... Um, at a band, one of our youth worship leaders, we, he was in a fairly good financial position, and um, he one day dared me to do something on the guitar, I can't even remember what, and he said, if you can do it, I will buy you a Mini Cooper. So then I didn't really think about it, but like, he dared me to do it, so I practiced it, I did it, and then the next Sunday he shows up with a little box, and he's like, you remember that day where I said, like, if you can do it, I'll give you a Mini Cooper, I'm like... Key? I'm like, finally, I'm one of those people who's going to say, like, someone gifted me a car. I open it, and it's a tiny little toy Mini Cooper. <laughs> He's like, I told you, I didn't tell you what size it will be. It looked like a Mini Cooper. It even had some of the characteristics. It had four wheels, and it could, like, roll. But it wasn't a Mini Cooper. There's four different things in there. They look the same. They even have some of the same characteristics. They are fluid. They are kind of see-through in color. But they are not the same thing. And we started this series with this video that says that even where Jesus, actually this was words coming out of Jesus' own mouth, that the faith of a mustard seed can move a mountain. And that seems incredible, right? So we said last week, we started it and we said, what is faith? Faith is unlimited trust in God's promises and in God in who he says he is. But how do we develop that kind of faith? How do we develop the kind of faith where we can move mountains? And I think this is the tricky part because often... I think especially in the Western world where we have no real persecution or anything, we think that keeping religious rules will move us to have that kind of faith. People think that a lot of biblical knowledge amounts to faith. So if a person has a lot of knowledge, they must be a disciple, they must be a Christian, they must be a good candidate for leadership in church. Or we think that if people do certain things, like if they can pray really well, or if they have a history of praying, or attending church, or giving to the poor, then that means that they must have faith. But sadly, I think the church in the Western world is rapidly declining. Because for generations, for two or three generations, people have believed that following religious rules will lead to a faith that can move mountains. But sadly, when the children looked at it, they saw a dead religion. And maybe you grew up in a house like that where you are watching this today for the first time or the second time, and you're struggling with faith because what you saw someone saying was Christianity, and then what you experienced, what you saw them living and what you heard them saying didn't line up. And what we're going to do today is we're going to look at two things that look pretty similar, but that aren't the same thing. One is religion, and one is faith in Jesus. You can be like, Lou, but you guys have a building, you have services, you, you pray, you do all that. Isn't that religion? Yes, there's certain characteristics that will be the same, but it's still not the same thing. So today... Our topic, the second part of our series, What is Faith? Our topic is faith is knowing God intimately. Faith is knowing God intimately. And we're going to go back to Hebrews 11. If you were here last week, we are just working through this one chapter. And at the end, the fifth week, we'll bring in chapter 10 and 12. But we're working through chapter 11. And last week, we did verses 1, 2, and 3. And then we added on 13 to 16. And today, we're going to read the part in between. Now, if you can remember last week, I shared with you in verse 2, 
where the Hebrews writer says there are certain things that these heroes of faith were commended for. And now we're going to start reading about these heroes of faith. So this is an example list that ancient authors use as a tool to challenge hearts, to challenge hearers to action. So he gives the evidence that there is desired course of action, the course of the action of faith will lead to the right destination. It's the best one to take if you look at the history. So we're going to read through a whole bunch of them today, verse 4 to 12. If you don't know who on any of these heroes are, if you didn't grow up in church, if you don't know your Bible, don't worry. I'm going to explain who each and every person is, so you'll quickly catch up. But we'll be reading from Hebrews 11. You can keep your Bibles open once we've done reading, verse 4 to 12. Okay, 4. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offering. And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he's dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. Now we get a little break. Without faith... It is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. And by his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is keeping with faith. By faith, Abraham When called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as at Isaac, his son, and Jacob, his son, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him, that's God, because she considered him faithful who has made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sands of the seashore. That's what we're going to read today. In each of these examples, these examples of faith, there are two things, an emphasis on two things, and we're going to work through those today. One is an act accomplished by faith. All of them did something because of their faith. And two, the right spiritual posture that they had. So we're going to break them up into three groups of two. That's kind of like how I see it. It naturally follows that. And we're going to start with the first two examples to figure out what is the difference between religion and faith. What does it mean to know God intimately? Now, the first two people we read about is Abel and Enoch. So Abel, who's Abel? In the beginning, we read that God created Adam and Eve, the first two people to have walked on earth, and they had two sons, Cain and Abel. Two guys that were both farmers. Cain, we read, worked the soil. So he was a fruit farmer or a vegetable farmer or something, and then Abel kept flocks. So he had cattle or sheep or goats or whatever he had back in the day. Both of them, we read in Genesis 4, brought an offering to God, Cain Some of the fruits, this is literally what the Bible says, some of the fruits from the soil and Abel, fat portions from some of the firstborn of the flock. But then we read something interesting. Both bring an offering. God looks at Cain's and he doesn't look at it with favor. God doesn't accept Cain's offering. But then God looks at Abel's offering and for some reason God does accept that. Now a lot of A lot of stuff has been written about that, that God, the grain offering wasn't as good as an offering of blood. But when you read through the Old Testament, grain offerings, olive oil offerings was part of their culture later on. So clearly both had spiritual value. Both were fine as offerings. So I don't think that's the case. Some people say, oh, but Cain didn't give like of the first portion, so he didn't give his tithe. He just gave something that was left over. Well, Abel gave the best of what he had. But that's not what it says. It says that 
Cain gave some of the fruits from the soil, and that Abel gave some of the fat, fat from some of the firstborns of the flock. So I think both of these interpretations are just ideas, four stretches. I think there's something that we find in the text that makes a huge difference in why God accepted the one man's offering and not the other one. We read that Cain became angry, and then in verse 7, God tells him this. He says, why are you angry? And then he says, if you do what is right, in Genesis 4 verse 7, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. He desires to have you, but you must rule over it. So although we do not exactly know what it is, we see that God warns him that sin is encroaching on his life, that there is something wrong with his heart attitude because God looks deeper than our actions, right? God looks at our intention. So his heart wasn't in the right place and God saw that and God warns him that there is a problem. But for Abel, it was different. Abel also just gave something, fat of some of his flock. But God looked at it with favor because his heart attitude was different. Then we get to Enoch. We move on a couple of generations. The great grandfather of Noah. I think everyone knows who Noah is, right? Whether you grew up in church or not, there's even been a movie made of him, a horrible account of the biblical story. But anyway, there's a, even a movie about Noah. But the man who built the ark, and Enoch was the great-grandfather of Noah, and we don't read much about him in the Bible. We read two things about him. One, he didn't die. There's no grave for Enoch. There's no body that was left behind. Enoch was taken directly into heaven by God himself. And there's only two times that we read about it. One was Enoch and one was Elijah. So we read about Enoch in Genesis 5.24. But then we read this as well. In Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews quotes the Greek version of the Old Testament. And it literally translates as Enoch was was commended as one who pleased God. But if you go back to the Hebrew, instead of the Greek version of it, it says that Enoch walked with God. He walked with God. He didn't just please God, he walked with God. So walking with someone means there's an intimacy between me and this person. You don't just walk with your enemies. You're like, hey, how was your day? I hate you, but I'm still just going to spend time with you. You don't do that, right? You walk with your wife. You walk with your children. You walk with your friends. You walk with people you love. He walked with God. His attention, his focus was on God. And there is a vital link with both Abel and Enoch between the internal, action, the internal attitude of their hearts and their external actions. And I'm like, where does these actions of bringing an offering that's accepted by God, how do we get to this point where, where God commends us and he, he just took him away from earth because God loved him so much? Where does that kind of faith come from? And it comes from a relationship with God that is about walking with him daily. You see, in religion, we follow rules to please God. We hope that if I do the right stuff, that if I show up on Sundays, if I read my Bible, if I pray, if I give my tithe, that I take care of the poor, if I do all these things, then maybe I will please God and God will be okay with me. But in Christianity, we don't follow rules to please God. We walk with God. We have a relationship with Him. And therefore, we understand his heart and his heart behind some of his rules. You see, in verse 6, that little break, we read the literally exact words. That rituals without faith means nothing. It says without faith, it is impossible to please God. So you can bring an offering like Cain. It is worth nothing if your heart is not in the right place. If there is not faith in it. Enoch walked with God, and that was the difference. It is impossible, verse 6 says, to please God without faith. So is it difficult to please God without faith? Can you still please God by making sure that you've done enough good things in your life? No, it's not difficult. It says it's impossible. 
Because we, you and I, we are all sinners. We all make mistakes. We all do things that separate us from God, that misses the mark that he has for our life. We will all mess up. If we were perfect, none of us would probably have been here. We would have been like Enoch in heaven with God. But we're still here. And we're not perfect. And we cannot do enough to please God. And therefore he says we need to do two things if we want to please God. One, we must believe that he exists. You cannot walk with someone if you don't believe they exist. Then you're walking with a ghost. And we go back to verse 1, right, where it said that faith, is about having that assurance in what we cannot see in God. But two, he says here in verse six, not only do we have to believe that God is there, but then he uses a specific word. He says, but they must also earnestly seek him. They must have a relationship with God. They must walk with God. That is what what pleasing God is about, not just about ticking a couple of boxes off, not having a to-do list and finishing that, but walking with God earnestly seeking him. See, here is something that might rock your world today. Just believing that God exists is not enough. Just knowing about Jesus is not enough. That doesn't please God. That doesn't give you a place in heaven. That just doesn't bring forgiveness for your sins. That doesn't repair your relationship with your father. In fact, James says that the demons knew who Jesus was. They believed in his existence, but they didn't love him. They didn't walk with him. So what happened to them? They were afraid. See, just believing in his existence is not enough. God doesn't settle for our mere acknowledgement of his existence. He wants a personal dynamic relationship with you that will change your life forever. And just if you wonder if it's worthwhile even seeking a faith like that, he just gives this little interjection in verse 6 where he's like, yes, it is. Because if you seek God, you will be rewarded. He says those who seek will be rewarded with his presence and with understanding of who God is. So if you're sitting here today and you're like, Louis, I don't get who he is. I don't know how you can believe this. He's like, this is the best way to figure it out. Your human, your little human, my little human, tiny mind cannot comprehend God. So if you want to know him, if you want to understand him, this is the thing. Seek him and you will be rewarded by finding him. It's that simple. Whether you know him, whether you know about him, whether you don't know him, the path is the same. We need to earnestly seek him. We need to spend time with him. We need to walk with him. That is the difference between religion, where I just keep rules, but I don't walk with him, versus faith, where I have a relationship with him because I walk with him and I get to know God's heart. But then we get the two middle examples. We move on to Noah and Abraham. Noah, we read about him in Genesis 6, was already an old man when God asked him to build a gigantic boat. I think it was 500 or something. They weren't limited to the number of years that we are limited to. And we read here in in Hebrews 11 that by holy fear, he built the boat. So it almost sounds like fire and brimstone preachers, right? If you don't come to church, you're going straight to hell. He was like, oh, I'm so afraid I'm just going to build a boat. But I don't think that is a good translation. The Greek word, eulabethes, means in reverence of or moved with fear. So it's not fear like you have for the boogeyman under your bed when you're five years old. It's not a fear that you have when your child first takes the car out on their own on the highway. It's not that kind of fear. It's a holy fear. It is reverence. It is respect. So he had so much respect for God's instruction that he decided to do a ridiculous thing, build a gigantic boat far from the ocean, far from a river that could, where this boat could be launched in. But he did it. He was the first man that we read in, about in the Bible that acted in faith, on a message from God. 
You see, he wasn't just acting on a hunch. He didn't see the weather patterns changing. They didn't predict global warming. We read that he was warned by God. And he heard God's voice and he so trusted God because he knew God that he did the crazy thing of building a boat. And if we read the story of Noah, his faith that stood on this warning of God that built this boat stands in complete contradiction to the faith of the world. They didn't have it. They were just living for themselves, pursuing their own selfish lust. While Noah stayed focused on God, while Noah, even though it affected his public standing and his reputation, walked with God. And it's not just me saying that. If you go and read in Genesis 6 verse 9, it actually stands there that Noah walked with God. He didn't just follow religious rules. He didn't just bring an offering because he had to. He didn't just build the boat based on a hunch. He walked with God. So he heard God's voice and he responded to that. Then we go to Abraham. And you can go and read his story in Genesis 11 to 25. And the Hebrew writer says he when he was called, left his house, left his family, everything to head to a country that was promised to him and he had no idea where he was going. I always imagine, for some reason in my head, Abram's journey like this. And he actually had a lot of stuff that he took with him. But I always see, you know, like in those old um, children's cartoons, like the stick with the little pouch, the red and white one at the back. Like I always kind of see Abram with his little stick, closing the gate behind him, stopping. He's like, okay, God, what direction? Where are we going? God is going, go left. He's like, okay. Because he never knew where he was going. He left his home. He left his wealth. He left their established reputation for a nomadic life in an unknown land. You don't just do something like that. Do you know why most people leave their lands? Because one, they're afraid because of war, because they're refugees, whatever. Two, because they're looking for a better future. They can find a better job, better pay or something. Or three, there's some crazy people that act based on a call of God. And the, Abraham was one of them. And that is a quality that faith has to it. Not always knowing where you're heading, but stepping out, out into the unknown. And in that moment, your faith is stretched. And listen, you can't do that based on religion. You have to follow God closely. You have to know Him personally. Because He knows the way. So even though I don't know the way, it's fine because I have a relationship with Him. I can just follow where He says I should go. That's what Abram did. And then we read that he continued living in tents in Canaan. Why? Because it was a symbol of his commitment to not settle until God told him to do so. So if you ask me, Louis, what is the difference between religion and relationship? I think the second thing is that a relationship with God is about listening to his voice. It's about hearing his voice. It's about listening to what he's telling you and then obeying his command. Again, now I didn't act on a hunch. He was warned. He heard God's voice. Abram didn't move because he thought he would get rich in a different country. He didn't move because there was war in his own country. He was called, the Bible says. See, religion will follow rules in order to be saved, in order to leave the bad country behind and go hope that you will enter a new one, whether you believe that religion will make a difference in this life, whether you believe it will bring you healing or prosperity, or whether that is believing that religion will bring you life after this, religion follows rules in order to enter a better country, in order to be saved, to not drown in the misery that's going on around you like the people of Noah's time. While a relationship with God, it's not about following rules. You know that you have a destination. You know that God has prepared something for you. You know that if you believe in Jesus, you have eternal life. That's why He died on the cross, so that there's no more separation between you and God, so that you have the promise of eternal life. You don't have to wonder about it, so we're not keeping a promise with the hope that we, or we're not keeping a rule with the hope that we will be saved, or the hope that we will have eternity ahead of us. We follow God because we hear His voice. We hear His call. 
A call that is so much better for your life than you can imagine. That has so much more in store for you than just blindly following rules or just living for yourself. See, faith is all about that confident action acting based on what God said. I can still remember, and some of you might have heard the story, but the morning that I got an email about this position at Grace Church, I woke Yolandi up and I said, Yolandi, we have to seriously pray about it because I read through this description of the church, and if I apply, I will have this job because I know this is where we're going. And it was literally like every step of the way. I just knew God was sending us somewhere, and I acted on it, and it was scary. It's still scary being in a different continent than your family. But we don't act just based on human instinct there. We act in accordance with what God says. Their eyes were on the future, verse 11 says, because they knew the architect of it. They knew the architect, God. They heard his voice. They knew him. But then we get to the last two examples, and that is Sarah and Abraham. Two people way past childbearing age. We continue Abraham's story, actually, in the last two examples. Sarah was about 90 years old when she heard that she's going to have a child. Abram was about 100 years old. And not just was Sarah too old, she could never conceive children. The first thing Abraham did when he heard from God that he was going to have offspring, too many to count. Do you know what he did the first time he heard that? He laughed, the Bible says. Do you know what the first thing was that Sarah did when she heard that she's going to have a child? She's been childless her whole life. She's 90 years old. Do you know what she did? She laughed. Because they're like, this is crazy. We can't have children. And then they did have a child. And I think through this whole story of them in their old age, where the Bible actually says in Hebrews now, Abram was a good just dead. He was that old. He was, had one foot in the grave. That's how I would say it. <laughs> Through the story of in their old age, they having a child, we are challenged to take our eyes off the obvious and to focus on the faithful God of integrity. Sarah laughed. Abraham laughed. But both of them didn't stay there. They changed their ways. Why? Because they both, both knew God, because they have journeyed with God for so many years that they knew His character. And although this was the most ridiculous thing they've ever heard, that a woman who couldn't have children for 90 years will suddenly conceive a child, and the man who's now 100 years old will conceive a child, although it was the most ridiculous thing they've ever heard, they trusted God because they knew His character, because they walked with Him. See, that's a third difference between religion and a relationship with Jesus. A relationship with God is about, and I wanted to use the word knowing his character. But I don't want to fall for the same trap where we think knowing about Jesus is good enough. Because knowing him is different than knowing about him. So understanding means something deeper. It means I have a deeper understanding of who he is. You see, in religion, we follow those rules to be blessed, for the promise to be kept. If I live a good enough life, maybe God will keep his promise of giving me a child. If I live a life good enough, maybe he will give me a house of my own. That's religion. But in a relationship with Jesus, I know that I can do nothing to earn God's blessing because he's faithful to his promises. So I don't act to earn his blessing. I act because I live in his promise, in his blessing. Because I know God's character, that he's a promise keeper. Two things can look exactly the same, but be completely different. Those glasses could all look the same, but they were completely different things. Faith and religion can look the same because it seems like we all follow rules because we all have these spiritual disciplines. We all sing songs. We all read books. We all do all these things, people from all kinds of religions. But it's not the same thing. 
even if it looks the same. The direction, the intention of our heart, the direction to whom we're pouring this out is completely different. In religion, I keep rules in order to please, in order to be saved, in order to be blessed. In relationship with God, what do we read about? We read that God is already pleased with us because of Jesus. We read that God will keep His promise because that is who He is. And we read that we are saved and we will be saved because that's who Jesus is, why He came. So suddenly, I don't follow rules with the hope that I might get these things. Suddenly, because of my relationship, my walk with God, I live differently, not because I'm a rule keeper, but because God is rubbing up on me. Because His character, His integrity, His love is rubbing up on me. The same thing happens when you get married. We have some real sports in South Africa called rugby. And um, we don't wear all kinds of padding to protect ourselves. But um, my sister was never a rugby fan. And then she married a big shot rugby player. He played provincial rugby and he was big into it. And suddenly she's at the stadiums and she's cheering and she knows all the rugby players and all the positions and all the rules. I'm like, what happened to my sister? She's like a cultural person. She like, sings in the choir and plays instruments. She doesn't care about sports. But Ivan does. So he rubbed off on her. So she started loving sports. And that's the same thing. We don't keep rules because we have to. But as we grow in our relationship with God, as we love Him, His beauty, His character, His order, the things that are good for us start rubbing off on us. And we naturally start doing it not to want, because we want to have a relationship with Him, but because we have one. And if you're sitting here today and you're like, Louis, I want to live like these people. I want to have faith that moves mountains. I want to walk with God. I want to hear His voice. I want to know His character, but I'm not like these people. I'm not perfect. I'm not good. I have too much sin. Like God will never accept me. He will never love me. I can never get that close to Him. I'm not a hero of faith. I'm not mentioned in Hebrews, and I will never be. Let me tell you, there's of all of these people, we don't read a lot about Abel and Enoch, but most of them had numerous mistakes in their lives. Noah was called the first person in the Bible to be called righteous, but he still sinned. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they all made mistakes. Abraham sometimes traded his wife through simple lies in order to save his own life. And I'm like, so what is the difference between them and ourselves? Between them and the religious people, them and the people who were rejected by God. The difference is that for a lifetime, they walked step by step in faith, keeping their focus on God. For a lifetime, they lived in a relationship with Him. So if you have no relationship with God today, He wants more for you. He doesn't want you to remain seeking for the rest of your life, hoping that there's something more out there, hoping that maybe you can create, meet your Creator or your Savior. If you just attend church on a Sunday or over Easter or Christmas, Jesus wants more for you. More than just keeping a tradition of coming to church twice a year. If you just follow rules because that's the way you were brought up, that's the way you think it should be, or to tick off boxes, He wants more for you. He doesn't need you to be perfect. He just wants you to trust Him, to have a relationship with Him, to start seeking Him, to start walking with Him, hearing His voice, getting to know His character. And it's as simple, the Bible says, as just responding to Him. Believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth. That's your step. So that's what I want to encourage you today. What is faith? Faith is not religion. 
Christian faith is not religion. It might look like it, but it's not the same thing. The Christian faith is about knowing God intimately. And we're going to celebrate what Jesus has done for us today. Him saving us. Him giving us a future. All of that He achieved on the cross. Are we going to celebrate that today with communion? But I'm going to pray for us first. And then I want to say this. If, <clears throat> if you're listening to this, if you're in the room or online, and you want to start your journey with Jesus, you, you're tired of religion, you're tired of nothing, you want to start the journey with Him, we would love to journey with you. And all you need to do is, if you're online, go to our website as a connection card, fill it in, or send us an email, info at gracechurch.ca. If you're in the building, you can send us an email or fill in a connection card at the desk. And all you need to do in the comments is let us know, I gave my life to Jesus today or I want to do it. And we will follow up with you and we will journey with you because we're a family. We're not alone in this. Just like they weren't alone, we're not alone. So let's pray. Jesus, thank you that in you, we have so much more than dead religion. So much more than just following rules for the sake of following rules. Thank you that in you, we can have a relationship with our Heavenly Father. We have a promise of eternal life after this. We have a promise of a plan that you have for our life here on earth. Jesus, I pray that we will not settle for mere religion. But that we will start seeking you earnestly. And that in that process that we will start walking with you. That we will start hearing your voice. That we will get to know your character to such an extent that it will change who we are. Jesus' name we pray. Amen.